God is good. All the time. All the time. And all the time. All the time. A blessed Sabbath to all of you. Amen. I thank God for this special privilege of being a part of this weekend stressing personal purity. Purity in all the areas of the life. Mm -hmm. I thank God for using Brother Ernest, who is the human instrumentality through him, through whom the invitation came. And uh, I am truly grateful because preaching is a tremendous privilege. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for it. I thank God for Pastor Hart, my friend and classmate from way back, for allowing me to occupy this sacred desk. And I thank my Heavenly Father for the privilege of rubbing shoulders with all those children of His who will be making a variety of presentations during the course of this weekend. And I hope you will make a concentrated effort to be present, that you may benefit as much as possible. My wife is not on my side, physically, but spiritually. She's back in Michigan. So God bless her. And there are some people watching online in Africa. They're friends of mine. So please, once in a while, say Amen. Amen. Yeah. So they will appreciate what I'm saying. Yeah. I am also delighted to spend another weekend with the Nwachuku family, led by His Royal Highness King Udo, seated next to Queen Ada. And since I'm a royal family, then I must be a prince. Somebody say Amen. Amen. So thank you again, my dear friends, for allowing me to disrupt your home for one weekend. I'm very grateful. I have some friends who are visiting from the Loma Linda area, the Colton, the Redlands area. I have the Whitecliffe family right in the front. God bless you. Always nice to see you. These people live in my heart. I have the Dela Cruz family standing back there. God bless you. I know they don't like to stand. They're shy. The closer you come to Christ, the shy you are. You notice that? Uh, are the Calabos here? Where are they? They are the Delotes. Are they here? Uh, there they are. Families of mine that I love. Anyone else whom I love from over the the calls and records? I don't want to miss anyone. All right. It is now 12 o'clock. I will do everything in my power to release you by one. Amen. But one person say amen. amen. <laughs> I will do all of my power to release you by one. Amen. All right. Before I begin, do three things for me. And they're all relatively simple. Favor number one, if you have a cell phone, and I know you do have one, some of you have two, please, as a favor to God, turn them off. Don't text in the presence of God. He may kill you. Why are you laughing? God is a very serious God. You know, sometimes I believe we think the Bible says, let us make God in our image. Mm -hmm. God is a holy God. When the angels come into his presence, they veil their thesis. Don't text in the presence of God. Please turn all your phones off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. What I'd like you to say is, Lord, Lord put your words in that, in that man's mouth. Amen. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. My words cannot heal you. They cannot help you. They cannot give life, but God's words can. Yeah. And favor number three, I want you very much to think. Come now, says the Bible, and let us do what? Reason together. That's an invitation from Christ. In Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 28, the Bible says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, Jesus reasoned. Paul, Acts 17 and 18, he reasoned, Acts 24, he reasoned of righteousness and justice, judgment, and of course, the resurrection. So we must think. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God in heaven, before
before you, before me, is a church of sinners. And standing for them in this pulpit is a sinner. Now God, all of us need your grace. We really need your grace, dear God. And I ask you in the name of Jesus, with heaven and earth as my witnesses, help us. Help me by speaking through me. Help those who are listening by enlightening their understanding, Father. Through your power that no one can resist, restrain the forces of darkness, that we may worship in peace. Father, let every heart receive the truth gladly. I pray not only for us, but wherever your people are worshiping you on this holy day around this world, bless them with your intimate presence. Amen. Father, let the word exert a converting influence on every mind. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Before I get into the message, which is entitled, Do This and Live. What did I say? Do, Do this, this and live. live. Who is visiting with us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? Amen. 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 You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Man. Ah, God bless you. Would you stand, please? If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, please stand. Stand, sir. Amen. Stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. Don't sit. I have one of the balcony, uh, rest on the main floor. On behalf of Seventh-day Adventists all over the world. How many of us are there? 17 million? Somewhere around there. I thank you for taking your time to come and distinguish this service with your presence. Amen. We are happy you've come. Yes. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. And may God bless you, bless your families, bless your health, bless your wealth, and protect you from harm and danger. When earthquakes hit California, may he protect your house. Amen. I'm not joking. And may he place upon you the divine wisdom to come back. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. God bless you. Amen. This do and live. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25. Luke is the third gospel. Luke was a medical doctor, but he was, he is better known for his preaching than for his medicine. Isn't that a nice way to be a doctor? More spiritual healing than physical, because you cannot separate the two. Well, from God's perspective, the world tries, but for God's point of view, the two go together. Luke was the only Bible writer who was not a Jew. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood and tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? An excellent question. Notice the word inherit. He wasn't asking, what shall I do to save myself? Because no one inherits anything from himself. Are you with me? Amen. Inheritance means I get something from someone else. Amen. And so his question was, what shall I do? Not just believe. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus Christ, without correcting the question with one iota, because it was an appropriate question, the Bible says, he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? It's very interesting that when the lawyer asked about salvation, Christ sent him to the law. Now we know the law doesn't save anyone, but no one can be saved whose life is not consistent with God's law. Amen. Are you with me? 
Amen. And so Jesus says, what is written in the law, how readest thou? Christ was big on reading. In Matthew 5, 19, reading from verse 3, the Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Hath he not read? If we would read, we would not be puzzled about whether we should keep the feast or not. If we would read, and by read I mean study. Because people read the newspaper, they don't study. I mean read as a study. If we would read, we would not be led astray by the 2520 prophecy that is so popular among Adventists. If we would read, we would realize that we're not like everybody else. Amen. Amen. If we would read, we would understand that the atonement of Christ did not end on the cross. Amen. Amen. If only God's people would read. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus said, what is written in the law, how readest thou? And he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto them, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. My sermon is not about the law, but I love the law. I believe God has put a conviction on my heart to lift up the law wherever I go. You know, that was one of the missions of Christ according to Isaiah 42, 21. He shall magnify the law and make it honorable. Amen. But that's not my mission today. Jesus said, thou hast answered right. This do and live. In the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Bible is clear. Anyone who does the law will live. For he that doeth them shall live in them. Of course, what you also need to add is that you can do them outside of Christ. Amen. Amen. But Jesus said, thou hast answered right, this do and live. This do and live. Thou shalt live. Now, let's look at Christ talking to someone else who has the precise question. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 18, as we continue with the subject, do this. And live is now 12.15. Let me worry about the time. I want you to relax and just listen to the message. Amen. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 18, the Bible says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's the same question. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. On the second occasion, Jesus directs the inquirer to the law. Now I need to say this because we live in an age when churches preach there is no law. Mm. Yep. I was listening to a gentleman called Crefro Dollar. God bless him, God loves him, God died for him. Are you with me? Amen. God is like much of what he says, but God loves him. And he said, Jesus does not want us to obey those ten things. I heard him. Just love God and love your neighbor. Which is a tricky response people have to the law. Because the Bible tells us, love God and love our neighbor. And so Jesus told this rich young ruler, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Of course, Christ does not go chronologically. As Dr. Levin said last night, adultery goes up front. You look at the list of sins in the Bible. Adultery fornication is usually fairly, are usually fairly up close to the front of the list. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Amen. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. It is a glorious example of self-delusion. Because the law of Christians, who would stand in God's face and tell God, I have done everything. <laughs> and so 
he told God, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou, how many things? One thing. I am not a professional surveyor, but my guess is most people will be lost because of one thing. One area in the life that they refuse to conquer. And so Jesus told the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, this do, do this one thing and thou shalt live. He tells the rich young ruler in Luke 18, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast. <laughs> How much was he told to sell? Oh. How much do you give to God when you give your life? Oh. Oh. Most of us give some of our lives to God. That's why there are so many miserable Christians. In Minister of Healing, page 480, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Many who profess to be Christ followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to Him for they shrink from the consequences that such a surrender may involve. Unless they do make this surrender, they cannot have peace. And so Jesus said, sell all that thou hast and distribute to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, finish it for me. Follow me. Follow me. One thing, by the way, as a means of a digression, to follow Christ is to have life. Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus said in John 8 verse 12, the Bible says, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So to follow Christ is to live. Amen. It's to have his life. And so when Jesus told the rich young ruler, follow me, he invited him to receive the very thing he inquired about. Uh, you're not listening to me. Amen. You're Amen. sleeping with your eyes open. <laughs> Follow me, says Jesus Christ. Do this one thing. Do this and live as our subject. And I want to identify today is the burden God put on my heart. One thing that makes an incalculable contribution to the weaknesses we're dealing with this weekend sexual weaknesses, immorality. In the book, Maranatha, page 62, paragraph 5, you may write this quotation down at the reference, not the quotation. Eloise writes these words. Remember, we did it with do this and live. Before I give you that quotation, let me give you this one, which contains the concept of morality and immorality. In Heavenly Places, page 194, paragraph 3. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to men. There is adultery a moral evil, yes or no? Is fornication a moral evil? Is pornography a moral evil? Is uh, lesbianism a moral evil? Is homosexuality a moral evil? I mean the behaviors. Is uh, bestiality a moral evil? Is incest a moral evil? Listen to the words of inspiration. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. Which means, if you consider the word foundation, what effectively lies on the foundation? Nothing. The foundation is the very bottom that supports all that is above. Are you with me? Amen. If we can deal then with this one thing, have I lost you? No. no. Have I offended you? No. Why do you look so dead? <laughs> I'm not joking. You look dead. Or are you processing what I'm saying? Ah, yeah. uh, okay. Well, then I have sinned. Forgive me. I look alive when you forgive. Intemperance. 
lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. Amen. Amen. When she says the ruin, what is she referring to? The sin of Adam and Eve. Listen to the words again. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. So where the problem began is where Jesus Christ began. The problem began with intemperance. Christ began the work of redemption on that point. And I shall show that to you in a minute. Mm. The fall of our first parents was caused by the indulgence of appetite. Amen. Amen. Now, Adventists love to eat. And I've always believed one of the most dangerous things you can do is to cut the line at an Adventist spotlight. Are you with me? You didn't get it. Don't cut the line at an Adventist spotlight. You may not live to eat that food because we are committed to food. We love to eat. And God invented eating. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. He invented drinking as well. And in the new world, he has a rage. We will also have to eat. Amen. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 69, paragraph 1. We read these powerful words. In order for man to retain an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Amen. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear away. So eating was arranged by God before sin, during sin, and after sin. Amen. So eating is not the problem. Our first parents fell because of the indulgence of appetite. Listen to how the quotation ends in Heavenly Places, page 194, paragraph 3. In the work of redemption, or in redemption, the denial of appetite is the first work of Christ. Now the other first things, last night we learned the first thing. Christian Tempers and Bible Hygiene, uh, page 136, paragraph 1. The first work of anyone who is interested in a reform is to purify the imagination. That's the first thing. There's another first thing, which is the denial of appetite. When we hear the word appetite, we always think of food. There's appetite for food. There's appetite for sexual expression. They're both appetites. Some people have an appetite that they can't control for partying. Some have an appetite for drugs. The appetite is a desire, it's an urge, it's a yearning for something. In redemption, the denial of appetite is the first work of Christ. This is biblically very evident because when Jesus contemplated when he was about to begin his public ministry, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now Satan was and remains the smartest person in the universe next to God. I heard a couple of groans, but you didn't hear what I said. Amen. Let me say it again. The only person in the universe smarter than Satan is God. Amen. Satan is not disorganized. Remember, he was once the highest angel. The Bible says in Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1083, paragraph 1, Bear in mind that it is none but God who can hold an argument with Satan. Yes. Wow. Christ's triumphant page, 190, paragraph 4. Christ had been warned not to enter into argument with Satan. In his humanity, the Father warned him, don't argue with him. Amen. Amen. This is the power you and I are up against. That's right. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Testimony 41, page 341, paragraph 1. These disturbing words, only God alone can limit the power of Satan. Amen. Amen. Not Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Now, keeping this in mind, here comes the devil. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hunger. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just about six weeks. Yeah, six, seven is 40 days. Well, six weeks. Satan could have come any time from day one on. He came when Christ was at his most vulnerable. Yep. Satan is tactical. What do I mean by that? He chooses not only his target, but the time to attack the target at his battleground. That's right. Amen. If you think you can outsmart Satan, all the evil angels in heaven, uh, not heaven, in hell, are laughing right now, and the holy angels are crying. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan attacked Christ in the very area where he attacked Adam. Because Christ was the second Adam, or the last Adam, as the Bible calls it. Where the first Adam fell is where the first Adam had to conquer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> now a quotation I promised you. Maranatha, page 62, paragraph 5. As we continue with the subject, do this and live. Listen carefully. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands who, if they had conquered on this point, how many points? One. What's the subject? Do this. Do this and live. And live. Amen. Listen again. Let me repeat again. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands who, if they had conquered on this point, would have had the moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation. Amen. Amen. Uh, you're not impressed. Amen. Amen. You're not impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Do you understand what we're being told by the pen of inspiration? If there's one area in the life to conquer in order to guarantee spiritual growth, conquer appetite. Amen. The conquer appetite is not just to conquer how much you eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's to conquer what you eat. When you eat. And maybe where you eat. And with whom you eat. I'm stretching it a little bit, but you get my drift. Amen. Surely it is not just how much you eat, yes. When and what. I've observed, after a very, very careful and unscientific survey, <laughs> it's my own survey, I like it. <laughs> Most of our suffering is unnecessary. Mm. Yes. I don't hear anything from the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people in the back, you think they're spectators looking down on you. Yeah. Is that where it is up there? Oh, one brother shook his hand. He spoke for all of you. Thank you. Uh, listen to me again. Most of the suffering that we undergo is unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that sin entered the world did not have to mean that we should have come to such a sorry state. If we would obey God, 
Now, this is a word most people don't like, including Christians. What's that word? Obey. Mm. I love to obey. Christians will do everything except obey. They will negotiate with God. They will reason. They will argue. They will employ some Aristotelian logic. They will do everything except obey. obey. That's why I say most of our suffering is unnecessary. Yes. I was preaching at the church. And after the message, the lady came to me. She said, Preacher, you beat me all over my head. <laughs> and I spoke about diet and that sort of thing. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody. She's suffering from hypertension. What's hypertension? I don't, right. I don't want to assume anything. She's <laughs> suffering from diabetes. And diabetes can lead to blindness. Yes. There's some fancy thing called peripheral neuropathy. Toes start falling off like whatever. She has those conditions. And she had been informed by medical experts if she would change her lifestyle. Diabetes could be reversed. The hypertension could go. She could keep her toes and get pedicures as often as she wanted. <laughs> but she wouldn't change. In her mind, she cannot change. And so her suffering was entirely unnecessary. And altogether self-inflicted. So when I said most of our suffering is unnecessary, I also need to say most of our suffering we bring on ourselves. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Blame the church, mm -hmm. your parents, mm -hmm. Barack Obama, mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, your husband, or your ex-wife. <laughs> Unless you're two years old or three, if you're a man or a woman, you are responsible for your choices. Amen. Amen. And Jesus says to you and to me, this do and live. And live. Amen. Just one thing, and we're stressing temperance. Mm -hmm. Let me show you the degree to which appetite can control the life. In Councils on Dance and Foods, page 148, paragraph 3. We have this statement that is almost impossible to believe. Speaking of the Israelites in the wilderness, the author writes these words. They preferred to endure slavery. Hmm? Even death. Even what? Death. Rather than to be deprived of flesh food. What is flesh food? Meat. 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 Not meat ministry, you were corrected on that. It's uh, <laughs> the We're told that the Israelites were so controlled by appetite, mm -hmm. they preferred to die than to eat the food God sent. Mm -hmm. Amen. Wow. Sister, don't say amen then. I know what you mean, but let's reserve the event for those of us who obey God. But God bless you, sister. Bless your vegetarian refrigerator. Are you with me? Amen. How can someone prefer to die than to give a pork or beef or lamb or anything else that lives? As someone said, has a face <laughs> and parents. <laughs> Let me tell you something that will alarm you at uh, 25 minutes to one. <laughs> Do you know what the purpose of meat is? Mm. Not to provide protein. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what the purpose of meat is. Councils for the church. Mm. Page 228, paragraph 2. Wake up the person next to you who may be sleeping. Me causes you to do that in church. 
<laughs> Are you all awake and alert? Yeah. Listen to the words. Speaking of God, the author says, He permitted that long-lived race, the people before the flood, to eat animal food in order to shorten their lives. The purpose of meat is to kill you. Amen. The amens died away. Amen. <laughs> You're not listening. This do. Amen. Let me say it again. He permitted that long live race to eat flesh food. And why did God do that? In order to shorten their lives. Now if the world has more chemicals today than it had back then, are you with me? If more diseases now than they had back then, if meat killed you then, what does it do to you now? Amen. You agree, Mr. Sir? Well, dress me eater right here in the air. <laughs> Let me talk about my people, black folk. <laughs> no, black folk, you gotta be black. You argue with me? Yeah. If you're not, don't try. <laughs> we love some fried chicken. <laughs> hmm? You gotta fry them in grease. <laughs> Everything has to be fried. Mm. Some crayfish or crawfish, whatever you call it. And some lobsters. And, and then we have more diabetes, hypertension, stroke, than the other four. And we call it racism. I call it bad choices. Are you with me? don't get it. Brothers, listen, listen to me. I just don't get it. This do. How many things? One. And what's the outcome? Live. Yes. Amen. I said to you, Satan is very smart, and he is. I'm not trying to give him any props. But God is smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, come on, say amen for God. Yeah. And God is more organized than Satan. You see, Satan got his organization skills from God because he was once God's chief executive officer. And God deliberately arranged for Adam and Eve to be tested in the area of appetite. It was not accidental. Now, God could have said, Adam, here's a test. Don't cross that river for 10 days. If you cross it, you sin. Or you could have said, Adam, uh, don't go to that part of the earth for 10 days. But God said, don't eat of that tree mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Anything God asks you to do, He makes it possible for you to do it. Those of you in college, university, you have professors who take great pride in writing difficult exams so they can develop a reputation on campus. That man writes the hardest exams. You always have those sadistic professors. God is a professor who writes easy exams. Yes. Let me show you how easy God's exam was and how powerful appetite is. The Bible says in Genesis 1, 29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for me, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. God said, The trees which should feed every living thing will be found all over the world. Now Adam was given dominion over the whole world, which means Adam could have eaten from any tree. Are you with me? Yeah. And of all the hundreds of thousands of trees in that new world, God reserved for himself one. Did God want Adam to pass? Yes. Yeah. 
Now God could have said, Adam, of all the 10,000 species of trees, I am keeping 9,999. One is for you. Don't eat of it. But only of my 9,999. He could have said, but he didn't. Let me show you how good God is again. God says, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Hmm? What day did he say? The seventh day. He calls it my day. Now, how many days did God make? He made seven. And God says, mankind, I'm giving, and there are seven days. You take six. Amen. How many am I keeping? One. Somebody say amen. For God. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Now, let me talk to all stingy people. God says, listen, if you have a hundred dollars, I want ten. <laughs> Come on, say amen. amen. Now, God could have said, give me ninety, and you keep ten. Gucci bags on your Gucci stuff. <laughs> but God doesn't do that. God says, you keep 90. Give me 10. Amen. Amen. How is he unreasonable? Amen. And so God told Adam, of all the trees in the garden and the whole world, just don't touch one. Christ triumphant, page 20, paragraph 6. These are likely words. He fell under the smallest test mm -hmm. the Lord could devise to prove his obedience. How is the test described? The smallest Smile. test. Child guidance, page 79, paragraph 5. It was the least test the Lord could give the holy pair in Eden. God shows the easiest test. Mm. And they fell. Mm. On the point of appetite. Mm -hmm. Reason with me now. Remember the quotation I gave you. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. If that is where sin began in that area, that's where the reclamation from sin has to begin. Amen. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Amen. Then you understand why the very first temptation Christ suffered was a temptation that appealed to his appetite. Let me tell you something about appetite. In this world, we separate the mind, the body, and the spirit, or the soul. When I say so, I don't mean, uh, uh, give me the word, preachers, I don't mean a, a soul that can die. I'm not referring to that theological rubbish. I'm not referring to that. We define these areas of a person, not God. If I have a problem with appetite at the physical level with food, it can spill over into appetite uncontrolled for something else. Amen. Ah, I said it clumsily so you did not respond. Okay, let me say it again. Because every aspect of a man or a woman, they are all connected. If I have a problem in the physical, it will eventually affect the mental and the spiritual. Amen. And so that lack of control of appetite with regard to food can have you or me at the point where we cannot control appetite for sex. Or for work, workaholic. Or for anything else. Are you following me? Amen. God arranged that every aspect of the being has a sympathetic connection to the next. Uh -huh. Listen to this. Let the mind become intelligent. Amen. And the will be placed on the Lord's side. And there will be a wonderful improvement in the physical health. My character and personality, volume 1, page 34, paragraph 3. Listen again. She's connecting physical benefits from a mental decision. Amen. Let the mind become intelligent and the will be placed on the Lord's side. A decision to obey God is the first step towards good health. Amen. Amen. And there will be a wonderful improvement, she said. Wonderful in the physical health. Amen. And so I say again, in that thing called appetite, appetite is a power, it's a force, and it has not got a conscience. 
You see, appetite does not have a mind of its own. Mm -hmm. Appetite is just a power which either grows stronger or grows weaker. Appetite does not think. Appetite for anything does not think. The thinking apparatus is not in the area of appetite. It is in the area of the will. Mm -hmm. yeah, amen. You see, are you with me? Yeah. God gave us what are called animal passions. And the word animal sounds negative, but it simply means the lower passion. It simply means the physical passion, like sexual uh, expression in appropriate context, and of course, eating food. Both of them are urges. Both of them are appetites. And both of them God arranged and put into us. One of the greatest ways to insult God is to take something He gave you for His glory and use it for His shame. Amen. Amen. And so God gave us sexual urges to express in appropriate context, as Dr. Lemon said last night, and we end up with homosexuality, <coughs> lesbianism, prostitutes, male and female. Yeah, that's, that's what we end up with. Misusing something God arranged to glorify Him. Amen. Give you something that perhaps will make more sense to you. God gave us a mind to study His Word. Yeah. And by studying the Word and the world in which we live, to see God more clearly, and we use that mind to say there's no God. Yeah. Amen. You with me? Yes. Amen. Let me say it again. God gave us a mind like His. To study the creed. You know, the Bible says in John Gatos, page 4 or 5, paragraph 3, the whole natural world is designed to be an interpreter of the things of God. And so God decided to study the world, go to the end of slugger, consider the ways and be wise. Study the world, study the trees, study the plant, study the flower, and see God. And we use our minds to say there is no God. Yeah. And people write doctoral dissertations and say there is no God, and they're they lionize all over the world as scholars. Uh, he said there's no God. <clears throat> Sexual appetite. Appetite for food. They were given to us by God as a natural expression of human conduct. What kind of expression? Yeah. Natural. <clears throat> appetite has to be controlled by a power that is higher than appetite. Amen. That power is the power of the will enlightened by the word of God. Amen. Amen. We call it conscience, the will, the higher powers. That is where the cockpit of the person exists. And so if you've, uh, you and I have the urge to eat and eat and eat and eat, then the higher power says no. No. You t appetite says food. That's all appetite can say. Appetite never says give me a break. Appetite always says food, food, or whatever, sex, sex. The higher power will say no, no, no. Appetite is like a child. A child never says, mommy, don't spend any money on me today. <laughs> Children don't say that. They don't say in a toy store, mommy, don't get me a toy. <laughs> you go by McDonald's, mommy, don't get me a happy meal. No, let's, let's economize. Children don't say that. There is an area of research and advertising called the nag factor. Where experts study how to get children to nag their parents. Yes, it is. It's called the nag factor. And many parents give into the nag factor and give their children whatever they want. So they nag their parents, and the parents respond to the nagging and simply prepare the children for hell by developing them a lack of control over their passions. I'm sick to death of your nagging. Here's the fruit loops. I'm tired of your nagging. Go watch TV. I am tired of your nagging. Here's another $200 electronic game that prepares you for hell and nowhere ruins your mind. You can't have said spiritual thing. I'm tired of your nagging. Here's a pair of sneakers that cost $5,000. Yeah. Right. That's appetite. Appetite is a nagging child that must be silenced and disciplined by the parent called the enlightened will. Amen. 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 Why do I 
I use the word enlightened? Because depending on how you're educated and brought up, your will may tell you to do something that's anti-God. Your conscience may direct you correctly. For instance, I don't mean to cause offense, but if you in the, the country called, used to be called New Guinea, half of it is now Indonesia, West Papua is an Indonesian territory. I was there last October. Cannibalism was widely practiced by the tribe of the mountains. It did not bother their conscience. Are you with me? It didn't. So the conscience has to be properly educated. And the only secure source of education is the Word of God. Yeah. And so my brothers and sisters are 10 minutes to one. Great. I call upon you in the name of Jesus. God says, do this. And live. And live. And live. And live. And Control appetite. Practice, what's the word? Temperance. That applies, since this is a sexual behavior weekend, it applies, as you heard last night, to the way you behave in the marriage bedroom. Talk to me, I haven't gone there, I'll hear you. Say something. Okay. There are some people who believe that God, does, God cannot enter into my bedroom. The church has no right to enter into my bedroom. Let me tell you something. God has a right to enter anywhere. Amen. And a married couple can offend God sexually as much as a fornicated couple. Amen. You know, we read all this rubbish, we watch The View, and listen to those half-mad women, and we, we do all these things, and then we bring these expectations into the bedroom. Listen to me, your husband does not run in the Kentucky Derby, and your wife is not a rubber man. Are you with me? <laughs> Listen to me. The behavior of the Christian in every area of life must be as different from the world as light is from darkness. Yeah. And many of us are wrestling with whatever we're wrestling with and God traces the problem back to an inability to practice or a refusal to practice temperance. Let me tell you something you ought to know that Satan knows. I almost call this message, do you know what Satan knows? <laughs> the North Pacific Union Gleaner, April 14, 1909, paragraph 12. Listen to this carefully. Satan knows. I'll whisper so you have to leave for the listen. Satan knows that he can have no great power over minds when the appetite is kept under control. Yeah. As when it is indulged. What does that quotation say? Simply this. Satan knows that he has an easy time with a man or a woman who can't control appetite. He has a difficult time with someone who can. It's not simply eat swiftly <laughs> and drink distilled water and uh, whatever else, and you see. It is the exercise of control over oneself through the abiding power of Christ. Amen. So that every aspect of the life is controlled, Amen. comes under the banner of godly temperance. Yeah. Amen. That includes those of us who work too much. There are people with heart attacks or stress or whatever else strokes. Why? Because constant work had a negative effect on the system. Constant work. No rest. And the body reacts. What did Jesus tell the disciples? Come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. Now, if you feel badly, don't be angry with me. I speak out of a heart of love. Amen. Yeah. It looks on my face, but it's in my heart. <laughs> Let me close. What's our subject? Do this. And live. Do what? Live. 
What is this? Practice. Friend, friend. What is the area that makes life easy for Satan? At the time. You have a bottle up today? Why don't you answer me? Yeah. Do we have a potluck today? Yeah. Yes. Will you forget the message? No. When the food is warmed and the aroma assails your nostrils. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is much more serious than you suspect. Yeah. You don't have to be a murderer to go to hell. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. You don't have to be a rapist. Someone who practices genocide who blows up your neighbor's car and shoots policemen, you do not have to do that. Satan knows he gets only few people to do those things. He knows that. But everyone has to eat and drink. There's a compulsion in the race to procreate. And in those areas, he works to bring about a loss of control. And where there's a loss of control, he steps in and takes control. Yeah. And so I said to you again, Satan knows that he can have no great power over mind when the appetite is kept under control. Appetite for anything. As when it is indulged. And the quotation ends this way, and he is constantly working to lead men to indulgence. Last night we heard a list of sins to the flesh in Romans and Galatians 5, 19, 19 21. But the works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, finish it for me, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meek, faith. What's the last one? When you practice all those gifts, you become a temperate person, someone under the control of God's laws Amen. of temperance, a balanced life, which is what God wants for us. And so Jesus says, do this and live. Let me give you some hope. A man spoke to me once, she said, Pastor, I have a problem with sexual urges. What can I do? Well, I'm no sex therapist. Uh, so I said, here's where you can start, other than praying and putting the word of God in your head. Stop eating meat. He said, what? I said, stop eating meat. Because meat will animalize you. And animals don't think about when and how. Are you with me? They're just hormonal and that's it. Stop eating meat. He said, okay, and he stopped for six weeks. Emailed me. He said, Pastor, I cannot believe it. My urges are down. They haven't gone, somebody say amen. <laughs> we need them, but they are down. They are manageable which is what God wants. Amen. This do. And live. And live. Amen. What's the principle we should practice? Temperance. What's that power we should control? Appetite. It is the area preferred by Satan for overthrowing us. And in the light of this week's emphasis, Sexual immorality can be traced to a lack of control of the appetite. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. And if we began to list them, we would be here all day. All we need to list is that one thing. If it's absent, it causes a downward spiral. If it is present, we move up into the presence of God. And that is by the abiding power of Christ 
to exercise the control that Jesus exercised. Whatever controls you is really your God. The one that Paul says in Ephesians 3, whose God is their belly. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let me say it again. For some Seventh-day Adventists, their God is their belly. Today, there is power to overcome. Somebody say amen. amen. And God is more eager to give that power than we are to ask for. Whether you need to break the power of smoking, drugs, sex, out of its context, eating all the time compulsively, people eat when they're depressed, they eat when they're unhappy, they eat when they fail an exam, they eat when they pass an exam, they eat for all kinds of reasons. And if that's the problem, the power to overcome that is available. Amen. Signs of the Times, December 28, 1891, paragraph 1. Listen to these words. The Holy Spirit puts forth its energies to break the power of Satan's attractions and temptations upon the human mind. Yeah. But the will must yield. Amen. Human cooperation must be enlisted, for this is the indisputable, indispensable condition of salvation. Amen. The will must yield, and the will is not part of you and me that decides yes or no. Makes choices. Amen. You ask God to take that. Purge it, purify it, sanctify it, cleanse it, then restore it to your mind and mind. So that the choices we exercise, the decisions we make, will be decisions He would make. Amen. Now that statement sounds impossible because we're all possessed of the sinful nature. What I'm saying to you is, despite the possession of the sinful nature, when God purifies the will, our choices become God's choices. Amen. Our choices. Our decisions become His. Our likes become His. Our dislikes become his. My brothers and sisters, you and I can choose the way Jesus chose. Amen. Jesus did not become an angel to show angels how to live. Hmm? He became a human being to show human beings how to live. How to live. Amen. Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. I, really, I said I have to finish, but let me just drive this home. Do you and I understand when God said, let us make man in our image, he intended for us to live his life? Amen. Even in the fallen condition, because the effects of the tree of life were still in Adam's descendants, we read the statement that those who lived before the flood were only a few steps from God. In their fallen condition, because they were so close to the tree of life, those who lived before the flood were only a few steps from God. Amen. It is still God's will that we live and reflect his image. Amen. And his image has not changed. His standard has not been lowered. Amen. Can I have 10 more minutes? Yes, yes. To tell you something. Yes. yes. There are people who say, but the Bible tells us to eat clean meat. All right? Yes. Let me open the word again. Yes. The Bible says eat clean meat. Let me uh, point something out to you. Let me see how you prefer. How many of you have children in school? Raise your hand. If you love your children, come on, raise your hand. All right. Here's your child in school, high school, college. The child is studying chemistry, the child is studying archaeology, whatever. The pass mark for the classes is 100. The, uh, the barely make it mark is 70. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. What mark do you want your child to aim for? 100. Yes. 
<laughs> Why? Because you have what kind of standards for your children? Ah. Now follow me closely. Is divorce God's original will, yes or no? No. Say it louder. No. Did he allow it? Yes. yes. Oh, answer me with life. Yes. But divorce was the result of what? Yes. The hardness. That's what Jesus said. Now divorce came from sin. Stay together came from where? God. From God. From God. Stay together came from God. That's why we have Calvary's cross. Yes. Hmm? What is ideal? What is allowed? Ah, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. I'm gonna say, all right. What is ideal? What is allowed? Which one should you shoot for? Ideal. Ideal. Now let's get to the meat. Before there was sin, what did people eat? Fruit. Herbs. Fruits. Nuts. You eat. You eat it. Are you with me? You didn't shake blood. Oh, come on, say amen. Now, why did meat come in? Because of sin. You see, sin brought the flood. The flood destroyed the earth. No trees, no fruits. God said, for a while, eat this meat. But now you and I have choices. Am I right? Now, here is no meat. That's ideal. Here is dead animals. That's allowed. Come on. Which one should you choose? No ideal. Which is what God wants. Why? Because in the new world, that's where we're going back. Amen. Why are we lowering our standards when it comes to eating, but we keep them high when it comes to academics? <laughs> I know you don't like me. <laughs> when I love you, come on, say amen. You know I love you, I'm commanded to love you. This is my commandment, that you love one another, so I love you. But I have to ram it down your throat. Let me tell you something else. I have seven minutes left on my tent. People say, Jesus had fish. So what? Huh. Let me tell you something about Jesus and the period in which he lived. If we would study the sanctuary, we would not use that argument. We are now living in what period of the sanctuary system? The day of atonement. Was any meat ever brought into the most holy place? No. no. Now, meat was brought into the holy place. Sometimes the priest would eat part of the sacrifice in the holy place. No meat was ever brought into the most holy place. Amen. We enter that phase October 22, 1918, Christ did not live during that time as a human being. He lived in the era when meat still came into the holy place and the outer court. But have you ever read the vision that I had? When she saw God's people in the holy place? where some meat was allowed. Hmm. And they were praying, and then Jesus did what? He moved and went where? No. Where there's no what? No. no meat. Now, shouldn't you follow Jesus? Yes. She said some people stayed back in the holy place. Jesus had left. And Satan came and breathed on them. And they thought he was crazy. Jesus is not in the holy place. He is in that part of the sanctuary, carrying out that phase of the atonement where there is no meat. So don't bad mouth Jesus. He ate fish. The fish was a thousand times cleaner then than it is now. Fish back then didn't have lead and PCB and BCP, and everything else. Amen. Now make a decision. Here's my decision, my choice. I want God to forgive me for all that I've done to injure my body, my soul, my mind. Because he gave them to me for his glory. Are you with me? Amen. Not for mine, for his glory. The only job description you have is to make God look good. Yeah. Listen to the words, let's make man in our image, not his. God's original will was you and I would have no image. But his image would be seen in us, it's not ours, it's his. When sin came, we got one. 
Now you heard that last night. When sin came, that's how we got one. But God's original arrangement was the only image on this earth will be mine housed in human beings. So I want God to forgive me for all I've done to destroy his image in me. I really mean that. And I want him to give me strength as I yield my will to him to represent him in every area of my life. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 974, Paragraph 3. These are encouraging words. It is not necessary to gain strength a month ahead. We are to conquer from day to day. Amen. How many of you will say, Lord, I have a problem with this appetite, this, that, or the other. I don't need to know what it is. God knows. Keep it private. But I, there is an area, this call is similar to last night, there is an area where I need to get serious. Open my eyes and show me how self-destructive my behavior is. I need it changed. Amen. And you say, Lord, I am resubmitting my mind, my will to you. And I want to victory Amen. in that area or the next. Is there someone who wants to make that commitment to God? I need victory in some area. If you're raising your hand, stand quickly. Let me finish the appeal, then we go. Ten after one. If your problem is meat, here's what I want you to do. If you're eating meat seven days a week, by next week, eat it five days a week. You don't change overnight. Then the next week, make it three times. Remember the man who Jesus healed who was blind? What did he say when Christ asked him, do you see? What did he say? I see men how? Yeah, he didn't see clearly. The sight gradually came. Remember the ten lepers? Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. The Bible says, as they went, they were healed. Now, as you try, the victory will come. The next week, eat me twice a week. The next week, once. Let me tell you something. Child guidance, I believe, page 200, paragraph 2. What we venture to do once, we are more apt to do again. Yeah. That applies on both sides of the ledger, good or bad. You make a right appetite choice once, it becomes easy to do it again. Yeah. Any five nickel and dime psychologists will tell you that, with all respects to Dr. Parkinson. <laughs> Are you following me? One right choice sets up the mind for another right choice. One wrong choice sets up the mind for another wrong choice. No wonder Paul said, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you. Amen. If your problem is drinking, and after this have a problem, gradually, gradually ask God victory. If your problem is overeating, get a family member, a friend to help you. Remember the man that had to be lowered through the roof? He couldn't do that for himself. Get someone you can trust who will not judge you. And say, when you see me about to overeat, attack me. You know what the Bible says? You should do put a knife to your throat. If your problem is late nights, that's lack of control. Not arrange for us to sleep. The medical experts said the best sleep come on, comes when between one, nine and two or ten and two, something like that. The sleep that repairs and heals and restores. Then you say, Father, let me go to bed one hour earlier. You won't become perfect overnight. It's discouraging to think that. Now your decision can be perfect. Are you with me? Your mind can be perfect in this decision. But the expression of that now will be gradual. Gradual does not mean slow. Gradual means step by step. Amen. Oh, you missed what I just said. Amen. Don't think gradual means slow. Gradual means step by step. But you can take steps quickly. When Philip said, show us the Father, it suffice us. Jesus responded in control shock. He said, have I been so long time with you? In three and a half years, says Jesus, you should know a lot more about me than you do. Amen. If the problem is sex, even in the marriage bed, and you're doing things that are people call the freaky. 
cause the angels to turn away. You ask God to help you. If it's outside, you ask God to help you. Father, today, today, you put some verses in your head that deal with the problem you have. If it's fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. 1 Timothy 5, 22, keep thyself pure. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee youthful lust. How many of you say, Lord, help me to gain this victory I've just committed myself to? One day at a time now, can I see your hand? One day at a time. One spoonful at a time. One glass at a time. The sixth commandment says, thou shalt not kill. It means you should not kill yourself as well as others. Bad health practices is suicide. Lack of control leads to immoral expressions in all areas of life. One more call. Is there someone listening to me? Listen carefully. Listen carefully. I know church audiences are trying to respond to appeals. Listen to me. You have not yet surrendered your life to Christ. What did I say? What did I say? And you want to surrender your life to Christ now. Do not surrender your life to Christ generationally. Your mother can't surrender your life to Christ. You're not a child of God because your father's a pastor. You have to make a personal, willful, deliberate, conscious decision. Listen again now. If you have not surrendered your life to Christ, you want to surrender your life to him, meaning he will control every area of your life. If there's someone who needs to do that, let me see your hand. All right? Are you serious? Come, come quickly, come, come, come. Come, come, come right here. The call is surrender your life to Christ. I didn't say the church. The church will come next. Christ is first. When Amen. Paul on the road to Damascus surrendered his life to Christ, then Christ said, you go to Ananias, the church. The surrender had to come first. Listen to me, the call is, I seriously want to surrender my life to Christ. Amen. It is Christ who died for you. It is Christ who intercedes. His life alone is the standard for admission into the kingdom. Anyone else? I want to surrender my life to Christ. She's coming. Well, let's have more than one, so it's done quickly. Somebody help this nice lady. I want your name. I want to pray for you very seriously. That God will keep you strong in this decision. Someone else come this side. Take some sister come. Take some names. I'll give out the paper. Let them fill it out. We can wait five more minutes. The call is, I want to surrender my life to Christ. Has to be surrendered to one power or the other. Is it the Christ or Satan? You make that choice. It's an amazing position to be in. Here's God, here's Satan. Whom we serve is up to us. Amen. Romans 6 16, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants they are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. It is we who choose whom we will serve, but you must serve someone. You can't have a half-hearted surrender to Christ. Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. He is not his own. Satan takes control of every mind that is not decidedly under the control of the Spirit of God. Are you decidedly a child of God? If you're not, you need to make it decisive now. Because the devil will possess your mind. You won't fall on the ground and fall on the mouth, but you will be a child of Satan if you're not fully a child of Christ. This is not intimidation tactics. This is biblical truth. Amen. You cannot follow God partially. God doesn't share the throne of your heart with Satan. Satan doesn't mind sharing it with God because Satan knows whatever he shares with God is his. For it to be God's, it must be God's alone. Last day offense, page 191, paragraph 5. God will accept nothing less than unreserved surrender. Is your life 
unreservedly in the hands of God? That's my question. And if it isn't, come. Do what's right. Do what's intelligent. Regardless of what your husband does, or your friends, 100% commitment to Christ. Anyone else? Anyone else? Final call. There's someone listening to me. You have drifted from God. You've gone far. You've drifted from God. You've gone far. You need to come back. This is not just casual recommitment. You have drifted from God. The prodigal son, prodigal daughter. You have gone to a far country. You need to come back. Who among us has drifted from God and needs to come back? You know you have. Okay, you've already come, sister. God bless you. Anyone? You've drifted from God. You need to come back. It's all right to have this conference. Then you go home. No, no, no. We want serious commitments. You drifted from God. You want to come back? God will welcome you with both open arms. He does not welcome you partially. He puts on you the best robe. He puts a ring on your hand, not jewelry. He puts the insignia which represents the power to transact business. He puts shoes on your feet. So you're not a slave. Slaves don't wear shoes. That's how God receives you. Brother, brother raises his hand, wants to come back. Just step out and join us right here, my brother. Just step out and join us. Don't be afraid, come. God bless you. God bless you. Nothing will change your life like Christ. Let me say it again. Nothing will change your life like Christ. Amen. Salvation is Christ. Forgiveness is Christ. Everything God does for you and for me, however large or small, is on the basis of Christ. Take away Christ, God can do nothing for us. I have drifted. I want to come back. Anyone else? I have to pray. So I can practice temperance in the pulpit. Anyone else? I have drifted. Come, sister, come. Come, sisters, come in good way for her. Amen. Come, sister, come. God bless you. Jesus loves you personally. You know, God loves us as though no one else on earth is alive. He loves you as though Christ died for you alone. That's how personal and precise the love of God is for us. While the sister comes, there she is. God bless you. Come, sister, God bless you. Don't stay where you are just to be cool. Are you with me? There's nothing cool about hell. Come. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father in heaven, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure is the gospel. The earthen vessels are human beings who preach it. And Father, you know how earthen I am. And so I ask you if in any way I've preached badly, forgive me. I was trying all my heart to get the message across. If I misrepresented you, I apologize in the presence of your people. Now, Lord, don't let my puny effort prevent you from working in the lives of those who came to hear the word. I am asking you now because you said you're not willing that any should perish. You, Father, touched those who responded. Whether by general response of those who came to say I need to give my life to Christ or those who came to say I drifted, I want to come back. I'm asking you now in the name of Jesus, a name you cannot resist. Move in their lives, dear God. Change their appetites. Change their likes and dislikes. Give them a love for you that is greater than a love for their own lives. Father, give us a serious heart regarding Jesus and a place in his kingdom when he comes and he is coming. Fortify us, dear God. Grant your spirit in a special way to those who have come, who have submitted their names and let this day mark an upward change in their walk. 
And for those who have come, who should have come and did not, for whatever reason I ask you, may God trouble them. I mean trouble them. You cannot force them, Father, but you can trouble them. How you trouble them is up to you. But when you have to trouble a person, it's never pleasant. It is better to come than to have you trouble us. And so, God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the available power. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who is able and has always demonstrated his power to defeat Satan. As we eat the food, Lord, we ask you to bless it. Bless it, dear God. In a world where so many people starve, we thank you for food. Give us a heart to share our goodness, our abundance with others. And help us to eat that food with the consciousness that whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we should do to the glory of God. Here is humble prayer. Save us when you come. In Jesus' name we pray that all God's people say,